name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and Amen. Remember, O most compassionate and humble Mary, never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implore thy help, and sought thy intercession, and was left unaided. Why, by this confidence we fly unto thee, O Virgin, the Virgin, our Mother. To thee we come before thee, we stand simple and sorrowful. Mother, the Word incarnate, despise our petition, and thy mercy is here and answer. May the seed of wisdom and spouse of the Holy Spirit, St. Joseph, St. Alphonse of Glory, St. Anthony Mary Claret, St. Leonard of Bois Maurice, St. Louis de Montfort, St. Pio, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So just to go over real quick what we've covered the past two nights, Once again, the first night, I spoke on the topic of debt and how that wasn't originally in God's plan, but because of sin, that is the consequences of sin. And because of that, every man must die. And that's for certain, but the only uncertain thing is the time of your death. I gave you many, many examples, true stories, and how many people are taken suddenly Many people are taken in their sleep. Most people are not prepared for their death, not ready, and never would imagine that this is the time. It's not a blessing, my friends, to be taken quickly. How many times do you hear when people, the loved one is in the hospital and they're suffering, they said, oh, I just wish God would take him quick. Why does she or he have to suffer so much? That's a blessing from God. That's your last chance, the last time you're hanging on the cross with Jesus and you can unite your suffering with Him and especially that you could still make acts of faith, hope, and love. And if you're a mortal sin, God forbid, how are you going to get to heaven if a priest doesn't come? And the church says there's only one way then and it's a great miracle that you have to make a perfect act of love which means you love God so much that you never want to offend Him, just out of love, not out of fear of going to hell. And if you think that's easy, my friend, especially if you are living a life of sin, it's not. So you want, the whole point is that every day wake up and say, I may die today. This may be my last day. Am I prepared to meet our Lord? Am I in sanctifying grace? I'm amazed, totally amazed. Every mission I I do, I'm still amazed. How many people come in the confessional, bless me, Father, if I have sinned, and it's been so many weeks, and they've been in mortal sin, two, three weeks, going to Mass, even though they don't receive communion. I say, what's wrong with you? You realize if you die, you're going to hell? If you're in sin, my friends, never put off your confession, never. And so, death is certain, but the time of our death is uncertain. And once we die, it's the most important moment of our whole life. It's forever lost or forever bliss in heaven. Heaven or hell, that's it. Yeah, you may have to go to purgatory, but if you go to purgatory, you're going to save your soul. So that's the most important moment of your whole pilgrimage on earth. This life is nothing. I don't care, you live to be 110, it goes fast. So yesterday I spoke about the general judgment and the particular judgment, how we have to have two judgments because man is an individual, so he must be judged as an individual, but he makes up part of society, and therefore he must be judged as a whole. How every good act you do affects the whole body of Christ. Every time you sin, it affects the whole body of Christ, the whole world. And so I went through a particular judgment. I went through an examination of conscience, because you're going to be judged on the Ten Commandments. And I went through that whole list. And I want to add two very important things. I don't know if it's the devil, but I forget this all the time. And I always have to mention it tonight on hell. And there's two sins that are very... Oh, it's just so, you want, if you, I don't want to say it's popular, but it's so unbelievable. People embrace these sins today. Number one 
is that you're not allowed to go to marriages that are not blessed in the Catholic Church if the parties are Catholic. So if you have a son or a daughter or a friend and they're getting married and they're Catholic, one of the parties, he's Catholic, and they want to get married outside the church, you cannot attend those weddings. If you have a son or daughter or a mother or father, whoever it is, and was married in the Catholic Church and was divorced, and they don't have an annulment, you cannot go to those marriages. It is a grave mortal sin. You are cooperating in evil. And I can't, and I'm going to tell you right now, many people I've helped with this over the years, and they tell me, I went to six priests. They told me I could go. So I said, so you, and you want to go to hell with them too? This is serious. And then these priests will tell you, well, you don't want to cut off communication. You let them know you don't approve of this, but you're going, why are you going to go celebrate someone crucifying Christ? Why? Why? And then and that's what I love. They say, okay, Father, I won't go to the ceremony, but I'll go to the reception. Is that all right? And then I use a, a very simple example. Picture of a young man says, Dad, I got my 45 here. I just loaded it. I'm locked and loaded. And I'm going to go kill Tommy around the corner. I don't like him. I don't like the way he looked at me. I'm going to blow his brains out. You want to come with me? You want to watch? He said, no, son, I won't watch. But after you shoot him, I'll, we'll go to the pub and have a few drinks and celebrate. And he laughed because it sounds so crazy. But when someone violates, uh, when someone breaks commandments and committing the sin of adultery, fornication, scandal, why you want to go celebrate with your son or daughter when they're crucifying Christ? And you're not going to convict them. You're not going to, you're condoning their sin. And you tell them it's all right. I've had so many families that come to me with this. Very few people will hold the line. Very few. But you can't do it. I know one man, he slept on the couch for six months because his wife's brother got married outside the church. I said, you can't go. So he slept on the couch for six months. But guess what? It was worth it because his wife was converted. And now she's a good Catholic. And those other people, those marriages don't work. And then what happens? You, you know, you went to the marriage and you say, oh, all right, I accept, you know, I accept what you're doing. And then the children come along and then they're locked in. The devil loves that, locks them in. How can I leave now? i got three, four children with them. So you cannot go to marriages of Catholics that are outside the church, that are, is not being blessed by the church. And that doesn't mean, you know, for your sons, your daughters, your friends, relatives, no matter who it is, you cannot go. And then I love it, so people say, well, is it all right if I just tell them uh, I have to go on a trip? I said, no, 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 no. What are you, a coward? What, are you afraid to tell them the truth? No, you got to tell them I cannot go because I love you. I can't go because if, if I really love you, I care about you, that means I will the highest good for you that you get to heaven. And I'm not going to tell you it's good to do things that prevent you from getting to heaven. That's real love. And real love means I have to correct you. And I will not go to that wedding. And not only can you not go to the wedding, you're not allowed to go to their houses. So if your son gets married outside the church, he's not blessed by the church, he's Catholic, and he invites you over for a barbecue, you have to say, I can't go. It's tough, huh? But you know what? Better, better to suffer now than in the next world. The other one I left out, which is so important, because this society that we're living in, this demonic government that runs our country, is promoting unnatural vices, promoting gay, as they say, homosexual, lesbian marriage. That is from hell. And homosexuality, lesbianism, is an abomination in God's sight. He hates that sin. Does he love the sinner? Of course he loves the sinner. But he despises that sin. It's a sin so horrible. Because it's against nature. I think it was St. Bridget of Sweden who was a great mystic. She used to be able to see demons. She said the most hideous, disgusting demons are those attached to homosexuals. 
And I don't know if it was her or another saint said, even the demons that are attached to that vice to help them do that, they cringe, they hate that vice too. It's so disgusting. You don't have to be clear on this. They're poisoning your children. I can't believe the young children, young adults come and they talk and they say, well, you're being judgmental, Father. You can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. God says, do not be judgmental. I said, no, you, you got it wrong. That means don't make a judgment where you have no basis to make it. A rash judgment. But God wants us to make judgments every day, every moment. Choose life or choose death. Choose good, choose evil. That's judgments. But they're pushing this. I don't watch TV, but I hear the, the new shows out there, the new normal. What do you mean the new normal? You people know what it's about. That's not normal. It's demonic. It's from hell. And all those people, every one, last one of them, are miserable. Many of them have been victims. We have to pray for them. But we're not going to win them over by saying, oh, I accept you as you are. And they don't listen to this nonsense that they're created that way. It says in the Bible, whatever God created, He created good. That tendencies, they're learned. All right? It's a learn, they learn it. And so, I want to be clear about that. And those are the two big things that I left out last night. Tonight we come to the top of, and I went over the general judgment. How at the end of the world, Jesus is going to consume the world by fire. All the dead will rise from the ground. All your body turns to ashes, but your ashes will all come together and you'll receive your body back. Those going to heaven are going to have a glorified body, and I'm going to go over that tomorrow night. It's beautiful. It's awesome. But those going to hell will have a body more hideous than any monster you could dream of. So much so, I think St. Bonaventure, the great doctor of the church, says if a body of one of the damned was to come onto the earth, just looking at it would give you a heart attack. The stench alone would kill every human being in the world. That's how horrible it is. In hell, we're going to learn that tonight. But hell is another subject that people don't want to talk about. Or there's two attitudes today mainly. Well, hell is, come on, it's a fairy tale. It doesn't exist. The devil's not real. Or oh, so what? It's, you know, it's just, it's a joke. I don't believe it at all. Or the other heresy today, which is really big, well, hell is not a place. <laughs> Many priests are preaching that nonsense. Bishops, prelates. Hell is not a place. The devil's not real. Or they say hell is not a place, but they say, all right, there's a hell, but in the end of the world, everyone will get out. That's an old heresy by origin. And the heretic, von Balthasar, revived it. And then many people are preaching it to this day. There's some big guru, priest, who's a big hotshot. He's supposed to be orthodox. He's on the Internet spewing his garbage out now. It's horrible. So many, many people deny hell. That's the devil's greatest weapon, to get you to deny his existence, to get you to believe that hell is a fairy tale, because then you don't have to worry. You could do whatever you want. You're going to be fine. His greatest weapon. I remember one of my favorite stories of St. Pio is when the lady came up to him and said, Padre Pio, I don't believe in hell. And she was like smiling. And he smiled and said, don't worry, when you get there you will. I don't know about you, I wouldn't want St. Pio telling me that because he was a great mystic. And so we see this denial of hell. So I want to read to you from Father Gabriel Amort was a the biggest exorcist that the church had in years. For 22 years, he was the head exorcist in Rome. He's no longer the head. But he's done literally thousands and thousands of exorcisms. And so I want to read from a little interview he had to show you, what I'm, to back up what I'm talking about. And so the interviewer says to him, Father, you are locked in daily battle with the devil. What do you see as Satan's greatest success? So Father Gabriel Amort's answer. The fact that he has managed to convince people that he does not exist. He has almost managed it even within the church. 
We have a clergy that's priests, an episcopate, bishops, who no longer believe in the devil, in exorcisms, in the exceptional evil the devil can instill, or even in the power that Jesus bestowed to cast out demons. For three centuries, the Latin church has almost totally abandoned the ministry of exorcisms. For three centuries. So because they no longer perform exorcisms or study them, and never having seen them, the clergy no longer believe in them. And they no longer believe in the devil. We have entire episcopates trying to counter exorcisms. Entire bishops' conferences trying to put an end to it. We have countries completely devoid of exorcists, just as, such as Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, and Portugal. This is a shameful shortfall. You hear this man saying, it's true. Most dioceses does not, do not have an exorcist. I, I don't know, but I would guess this one doesn't either. In this diocese, I think you need an exorcist in every parish. And I mean that. We needed many, many exorcists in the church today. And there's very few. The last I heard in the United States, publicly known, there's only, they say there's only 11. I think there's a little more than that. But 11, you imagine? To be an exorcist, you have to be appointed by the bishop, but as the exorcist of the diocese. That doesn't mean there's other priests. They can do exorcism too with permission, but to be a exorcist, that means you're appointed. This is scary, my friends. So the interviewer said to Father Gabriel Mott, he says, you haven't mentioned France, the great daughter of the church, right? So is the situation any different? And Father Gabriel said, the most famous French exorcist, Isidore Frock, wrote a book entitled Exorcist. Who they are and what they do. This book never once says that exorcisms are performed in certain cases. And the author has said on French television on several occasions that he has never performed an exorcism and never will. Well, what are you an exorcist for? The head. Out of a hundred French exorcists, they have a hundred in France, only five of them believe in the devil and perform exorcisms. Do you hear that? Only five of a hundred exorcists in France believe in the devil. All the others send the people who come to them to psychiatrists. And we all know this. They're crazy, most of them. So these exorcists, 95 of them don't believe in the devil. That makes them heretics. That means they're outside the one holy Catholic apostolic church should make us weep. Not only all, especially you people, you need help. You need help. We need this. We have to rediscover how to combat the devil. Because he's a roaring lion looking to devour you. He goes on, the bishops are the first victim of this situation in the Catholic Church whose belief that the devil exists is fading. How <laughs> shame. The bishop who's the shepherd who wears a mitre and he carries a scepter. What's the scepter for? To chase away the wolf. Who's the wolf? Satan. The scepter there is a sign, I'm going to defend you and I'm going to lay my life down for you. But meanwhile, they're letting them devour the flock. Letting them devour. Believe me, I, <laughs> I've been a lot involved a lot in fighting the evil one and all kinds of deliverance prayers and everything else, helping people, haunted houses, I go on and on. It's sad. They can't get help. They go to priest after priest. They can't get help. Just to let you know, you point out, I want it, it's coming to me now. I have many cases where parents have so many problems with their children. They say, Father, the kid's just a devil. There's nothing to do. I had one case where they were ready to put this girl away. She was nine years old. And all the priests told them, put her away. There's nothing else you can do. You'll never be able to get her under control. She had rage, this girl, hatred. Nine years old. She was told by all the psychiatrists, you have to put her away. 
she tried for years and she was broken down and a friend of mine she talked to my friend said why don't you call Father Isaac maybe he could help you she said what's he going to do so she called me and I started to do prayers with this little child on the phone and there was a change pretty quick not 100% and then I finally I was a distance when I finally met the girl did deliverance on her she's an angel now angel she was an ugly, little nasty kid when she came to the door that day when I never forget open the door. She was like almost growling at me. And I said, ah, sit down. We did the deliverance prayer. She lit up like a Christmas tree. Beautiful smile. Now it's been like five years. That girl has been an angel. And the mother broke down crying. Because the mother thought it was a disciplinary problem, a mental problem. The kid was frustrated because she didn't want to do these things. You don't know why she's doing these things. She wasn't possessed. But there was spiritual warfare going on. So the mother cried. Cause she, I said, what do you cry? Cry for joy. Thank God we found out what it really was. And I have case after case after case like that. Now, sometimes it's not that. But I've found more, many times I've helped these little children who are out of control with a couple of deliverance prayers. And they're little angels. And the, the action, reaction from the parents usually is to cry because they couldn't believe they were ready to put them away. I could tell you many stories. So we need this. We need this. He goes, okay, do you feel that Satanism is on the rise? Father Gabriel Mort says, yes, very much so. When faith falls away, when people fall away from faith, superstition increases. To use biblical language, I would say that one abandons God and turns to idolatry. In modern terms, I would say that one abandons God and turns to the occult. Okay? The cult of the devil is proclaimed to entire peoples through the satanic rock music. Satanic rock music of individuals like Marilyn Manson. Even children are not immune from this assault. So this demonic music, it's from hell. This rock and roll, hip hop, it's from hell. You let your children listen to that, shame on you. How can you let your children listen to, to hip hop and other demonic music that says, kill your mother, kill your father? That treat women like, like animals. These rock groups, they consecrate their albums to Satan. I have worked with people that were so involved with demonic music. I, 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 unbelievable. Unbelievable. I had one man that came back from the war. They said, nobody could help this guy. You want to go? I just went to the VA. I seen him. He looked like a big, heavy guy. He sat there like, like that. Couldn't talk. Talk to him. He grunt, maybe. He was into, I'll, I'll just sum it up real quick. His main bondage, satanic music. Heavy metal, death music. So we came to a certain point. We were making some progress, but we hit the wall. They said, you got to get rid of all your music. you got to sever all your ties with Satan, or he'll own you forever. I said, you got to dump the music. He wanted, I said, no, you have to do it. You have to engage your will. So finally one day when that man, his kids called me, come, come here, I need your support at least. I went, he said, I'm going to do it. He broke out in cold sweats. He was like tortured. I don't, I'm not a big computer whiz, but I know one thing. It's not hard to delete things. So it took like 40 minutes, at least 45 minutes, to delete all his songs, hard drives. And I said, whoa, man. I said, how much did that cost you? He says, nothing. It was free on the Internet. I said, no, you're wrong. The price was your soul. So after he... Got rid of all that music. I confessed him, did a deliverance. His mother cried. She says she had her son back. He was like normal again. He was like a zombie for years. The music is demonic. It lets the devil in. Don't let your children, don't let them listen to it. So what everyone else is listening to? Do you want to go to hell with everyone else? This is bad, this music. Very bad. So he goes on, he says, even children are not immune from this assault. 
Their comics teach them magic and Satanism. Comic books. Seances are very common in which the dead are summoned in search of answers. Today, people can hold seances by computers, telephones, recorders. Spiritist writing is popular. Surveys have found that 37% of students have played with a Ouija board at least once. This is a seance proper. At a school where I was invited to speak, the pupils told me that they even did this during their religious instruction period with the teacher's encouragement. And so the devil, once again, he uses the, where do you get the Ouija board? Toys R Us. It's not a toy. Curiosity. You know, all these things. Comic books. We, I mean, I look at these comics, I can't believe how immodest the pornography. You know, Disney is, is disgusting. Disney, they have embedded art. I won't even mention, I can't mention from here, some of the images that are in all of Disney's movies. But you could look it up, and all of a sudden you see things that would spin your head, and they're poisoning your children. Disney owns tons of other companies that promote satanic music and other occult things. It's an evil corporation, and everyone should boycott it. You're playing with fire. I'm telling you, look it up. You don't believe me? Go on the internet and look up, say, uh, you know, Disney embedded art. Oh, you'll see pictures, it will spin your head. The images that are there. Getting back to the music one more time. Recently I had to help someone who's in bondage. I said, oh, your music has to go. You have to break everything. You have to do it. They called me up, the husband and the wife. They said, you're not going to believe this. I got a Led Zeppelin album here, a CD. You know, you know how easy it is to break a CD? They just shatter. We can't break it. He tried to cut it with a knife. He couldn't cut it. Nothing. He says, Father, I'm bending this. It's, it's like a rubber band. I said, hit it with the holy water I gave you and throw some exercise salt on it. When they did it, the whole thing exploded. Had another man who had some symbolic music. I said, you got to get rid of it. He was in another Led Zeppelin album. He said, he had one. He was trying to break it. He couldn't break it. It was bending like a rubber band again. And then he, he did what I told him. He took holy water. And he was in his garage. And he said when he went to break it then, it shattered in hundreds of pieces. He said, but there was an explosion in the garage. It sounded like someone shot off a double, uh, you know, shotgun. That's not normal. Because these things are demonic. I took a young kid. His mother brought him to me once. I wasn't even a priest yet. And he's listening to this heavy metal music. I said, let me see. It was a cassette those days. He said, give me that thing. He says, I said, what are you going to do? So I pulled out all the tape. I had a big fire going in the back of the friary. I said, I'm going to show you. I threw it in the fire. It didn't burn. You know how flammable that material is? I said, I'm going to show you. See, this stuff won't burn. You know why? Because it's, <laughs> it's from hell. So I took holy water. I splashed it in holy water on the fire. The holy water hit the fire. And the tape, the thing went up, poof. The devil has a strong arm on these things that you're exposing your children to. The TV, all these things. So he goes on. He says, do these things really work, what we're talking about? Father Gabriel says, there is no distinction between white and black magic. When magic works, it is always the work of the devil. All the forms of occultism, such as mass recourse to Eastern religions with their esoteric connotations, are an open door for the devil. And so he comes in immediately. Immediately. You hear what he's saying? So many people are drawn into the occult. How? Through mass recourse to Eastern religions. Buddhist, Hindu. They get involved with yoga. Yoga is from hell. People get mad at me all the time. You mean I got to stop doing that? Yeah, you better stop doing those exercises. And they tell you in the yoga, sometimes they'll tell you you have to do these mantras where you get on your head and you start repeating all these names over and over again. So I had one man, I said, I want you to go tell him you want to know what the names mean. And he, he went, finally he did. I said, he ain't going to want to tell you. And then tell them, you keep 
persist and say, oh, come on, I want to know what they mean. I'm not going to come back. So he did it, and the guy told him, they're names of fallen demons. Demons. So when he's on his head chanting this particular name, calling the fallen demon, guess what? That demon's very happy to come. Just like when you call on your guardian angel, he's happy to come. He never leaves your soul. Same thing with the bad angels. Same thing. So this Eastern religion is really making a boom now. It's evil. Evil. You remember what it says in the Bible, that the gods of the pagans are demons. The gods of the pagans are demons. Eastern religions and so on and so on. So you got to avoid all this stuff. How does the devil go about seducing men and women? Father Gabriel says, his strategy is monotonous. I have told him so and he admits it. He convinces people that there is no hell. That there is no sin. Just one more experience to live. Lust, success, and power are the three great passions on which the devil insists. You hear that? Do you have these in your life? Lust, success, and power are the three great passions on which the devil insists. How many cases of demonic possession have you come across? Father Gabriel says, after the first hundred, I stopped counting. Just to let you know, many people have to go to Rome to get delivered if they're possessed because there's no exorcist around. And that's why he's so busy. How does one fall victim to the devil? Father Gabriel's response we can fall foul of the exceptional evil sent by the devil for four reasons. If it works to the good of the person, in case of the saints. Very few times, but in history there have been some saints that have even, say, been possessed or tortured by the devil. Like St. Pio, God let St. Pio, he would physically get beat up by the devil. I saw the pictures, real black and white ones, where he has black eyes. He looked like he was in a fight with ten men and he was in a fight with the devil. But God allowed that because he was a victim soul. But normally, you don't have to worry about that. Number two, persistent irreversibly in sin. So if you keep on living a life of sin, mortal sin, your soul is wide open. It's, it's like opening those doors in the back of the church and all the windows. Your soul, you're saying, come on in, baby. Come on. I'm empty because when you're a mortal sin, your soul is dead. You are empty. When you're in a state of grace, the Holy Trinity dwells within you. The next is because of a curse by the devil. People don't believe in curses. I even hear exorcists. I, I laugh at them. They say they don't believe in curses. Are you for real? An exorcist don't believe that curses can take. And I know different. From my experience as a priest and working with this stuff, they're real. Real. Do you have to worry that people put curses on you? If you're not in the state of grace, you have to worry. So if you're in a state of mortal sin and they're putting curses on you, you got a problem. Because if God, of course, he has to permit it, but your soul is wide open. But if you're in sanctifying grace, your soul is filled with God. You're protected. So you either have sanctifying grace or not. And so if someone puts a curse on you, yesterday I'll tell the story again for those of you who are here. Father Gabriel tells a story of a young Italian man who wanted to marry a girl and the mother didn't want him to. And so the mother cursed him on the wedding day and she said, you will come back and die in the bed that you were born in. And the mother didn't want nothing to do with him. So ten years later or so, he comes back to town and he really missed his mother. He goes, maybe she changed. Maybe she'll accept me. So he went to visit her, said hello. And then there was a storm or something that night. And the mother said, oh, sleep in your bed. Don't worry about it. That was the bed he was born in. Guess what? He never woke up. He died. The curse took. Curses are real. And there's many people out there, believe me, like you go... You know, people don't like to hear it, but why are some of these uh, natural catastrophes hidden in some of these places? Why? Because they're chastisements from God. A lot of these places are centers of the occult. You go to New Orleans, you could go down the French quarters, walk into any a store, it's a witch warlock, 
He said, I want to put a curse on him, her. And they'll put a curse on that person for you. That's it's easy to get, you know, all these palm readers, psychics, they'll put curses on people. Those places are evil. And the occult's on the rise today, my friend, the occult. And the last one is by practicing occultism. So those that get involved with the occult, all right, they could get possessed very easy. And, you know, when people come to Satan, a lot of, he, he sizes up people. He knows who he can get. And usually, you know who he looks for? He looks for the young ones that's been a, a person that's been rejected, that's been abused, a person that's been beat down, a person that nobody likes, they're isolated. Oh, he, he goes for those people. Because a lot of them are filled with hatred because they've been abused, unfortunately. And the devil offers them power. So, and then they could inflict pain on others. And this is bad. But that's why they do it sometimes. But what they don't realize in the beginning is that the devil is not a nice master. He'll give you something in the beginning, but then he owns you. And he's vicious. And he'll get you to the point where you want to commit suicide and kill yourself. And then I'm going to just end with a comment about Harry Potter. He says, behind Harry Potter hides the signature of the king of darkness, the devil. Father Gabriel Mott has been quoting that J.K. Rowland's books make a false distinction between black and white magic. Or Mort says that distinction does not exist because magic is always a turn to the devil. And so Harry Potter, my friends, is an open door to the Satan. Open door. Open door. So we see people today, this is his greatest weapon, and how many people don't believe in the devil. Years ago I read an article, now some people are saying it's not true, but I tell the story anyway. And there's a Russian scientist, they wanted to drill into the center of the earth, see how far they can go. And they drilled five miles down, and then they, they bit hit an open area, so they pulled a bit up and they put a microphone down there and they put headphones on. And you could hear this on the internet, they have it. And you hear the cries and screams of people being tortured. And they say they were, they were atheists, they were so afraid, they covered, they pulled the bit up, the microphone, they covered the hole and they ran. Now it just so happens that all the fathers, doctors of the church, the scriptures say, guess where hell is? In the center of the earth. It's a place. It's a place. I gave a mission, uh, five, six years ago, seven years ago, and two months after the mission, the priest called me. And he goes, man, wait till you hear this story. He goes, there was a woman, a married woman, and her son was selling drugs and doing drugs. And she was begging God for his conversion. She begged him to come to the mission. So he called my friend up and said, Father, I only went one night. And I, it just so happened to be the night on hell. And he goes, so I listened to that priest, went home. Two months later... He said he was sleeping. He woke up in the middle of the night. He wasn't drunk. He wasn't stoned. He said he went to go to the bathroom. And all of a sudden, he says, he's literally in hell. And he says, I want to tell you something. Everything that priest said that night is all true. Because I experienced it all. And I thought I was condemned to hell for eternity. And he goes, and I don't know how long I was there for. But then eventually I woke up back in my room. Wide awake. Wide awake. And he said, hell is real. Just like the priest said. So listen to the talk tonight. Listen to as we describe hell. If you don't believe in hell, my friend, you call Christ a liar. In the New Testament, he mentions hell around 33 or 36 times. It's all over the, New, the gospel. Why is Christ warning you about hell? Because he don't want you to go there. So hell is the one doctrine, is the one doctrine of faith that is denied by most people today. Because the devil's greatest weapon, once again, is to get us to believe that there is no hell. Or that if there is one, we'll get out eventually. Hell is a place of punishment for those who die in mortal sin, deprived forever of the sight of God, to suffer terrible 
in eternal torment. Those merit hell according to the gospel who reject the faith of Christ and his church and the light of the gospel. You can't go to heaven unless you accept the Catholic Church. All right? So those go to hell once who reject the faith of Christ and his church and the light of the gospel. And according to the parables of the foolish virgins, the wicked rich man, the man who failed to make use of his talents, the man who did not show charity towards his neighbor, and the one who had not on his wedding garment, which signified the state of sanctifying grace. You remember the parable of the rich man that wouldn't give a crumb to Lazarus who was starving? Remember when he goes to hell, he says, Can you send an angel to go back to my brothers to warn them? Don't come here. And you know what the commentary from the fathers are on that? Do you think that he really loves his brothers? In hell, there is no love. Only hatred, as we'll find out. So why did he want his brothers to be warned? And the fathers and the doctors tell us simply because everyone that you know in hell, you help get there, and they help get you there. And that means your hell will be a million times worse because you'll be cursing at each other for eternity. You help me get here, and your hell will be worse. Serious stuff. Those also merit hell, the Apostle St. Paul tells us, who are impious, idolaters, unjust, thieves, covetous, drunkards, impure adulterers, and so forth. To these one might add blasphemers, apostates, sacrilegious, militant, atheists, murderers, suicides, scandal mongers, and so on. And here's all scriptures. I can give you all the quotes. So after the sentence of the sovereign judge on the judgment day, the lost will immediately be seized by the demons and dragged to hell, where in addition to their own sufferings, they will be tormented forever by the demons. They will suffer not only in their soul, but also in the body. But the suffering of the body will, will not be the same for all, for the punishment will be proportionate to the number and gravity of sins committed by each one. So everyone in hell has a different degree of punishment. And the more you offended God, the more you will suffer. In committing sin, you remember, you're a composite of body and soul. And so both body and soul must be punished if it ends up in hell. Because, you know, the body didn't get there on its own. The soul didn't get there on its own. So they cooperated. In committing sins, my friend, the sinner does two major evils. Number one, he abandoned God, the sovereign good, and he turns to the creature. He turns from the infinite good to the finite. Since by turning to creatures the sinner offends God, he is justly tortured in hell by the same creatures, by fire and the devils. In this punishment consists the pain of sense. But because his greatest guilt and the malice of his sins consist in turning his back on God, his principal torment, his hell, will be the pain of loss or the pain arising of having lost God. So first we'll go over the pain of sense, the body. All the senses and powers of the dam will have their proper torments. And the more a person was offended God by any sense, the more he will be tortured in that sense. In the book of Wisdom, chapter 11, it says, verse 17, that they might know that by what a things a man sins, by the same also he is tormented. And think about it, my friends. Even in this world, when you commit sins, you're tortured by the same sin. When you keep committing the same sin, it takes control over you. Especially those wicked sins of the flesh. Because when you start committing them, you can't stop. When you start committing them, you want more. You can never quench your thirst. And it's a torture. But in hell, once again, the more you offended God with your eyes, you'll be suffering. We're going to go through the senses now. So your sight. You know, all our senses, we have five senses. And our knowledge comes through our senses. And so when we use our senses to offend God, we'll be punished. 
the sight for all the times you looked at immodest pictures, for all the times you looked at pornography, for all the times you looked at things you had no business looking at, TV, bad stuff, you will suffer in your sight. The sight will be tormented mainly with darkness. The smoke that it issues from the fire of hell shall form a storm of darkness, which according to St. Jude will blind the dam. This is biblical. There's a fire in hell and the smoke is going to blind you. If you don't think that happens, talk to any fireman who's been in fires. You can't see. It touches you. Your eyes, you're blind in fire, in smoke. The only light in hell will serve to torment the reprobates, for they will see the deformities of their associates and the devils. So once in a while there will be some light, but it will only be to torture you, to see the ugliness of demons, to see your neighbor who looks so hideous. It will put fear in you, the sense of smell. The dam must remain in the midst of so many millions of reprobates, the greater the number, the more insufferable will be their torments. St. Bonaventure tells us that if the body of one of the damned was placed on this earth now, it would by its stench alone be sufficient to cause the death of all men. And you, you probably say, ah, that's impossible. Oh, no, it's not. Some of the worst smells, one of the worst smells you could ever smell is a dead body. I've been in places where the smell so bad you almost want to vomit. That's nothing compared to hell. Their sufferings are even more intolerable on account of the stench, on account of the shrieks. Imagine if one smells that bad, one body, what about billions? What about billions? Their suffering will increase because of the stench, on account of the shrieks of the dam, and on account of the narrowness of the place. In hell there will be one over the other, like sheep gathered together in the winter. They are, said David, laid in hell like sheep. From this will arise the pain of immobility. In whatever position the dam will fall into hell the last day, in that they must remain, without ever changing their posture, or without ever being able to move the hand or foot as long as God will be God. Your sense of hearing, for all the times you listen to impure jokes, for all the time you listen to bad music that blasphemes God, bad music, and all the time you listen to gossip, detraction, calumny, you will suffer in your sense of hearing. The sense of hearing will be tormented by the unceasing howling and wailing of those miserable beings who are sunk in an abyss of despair. The devils will torment the damned by continual noises. They must listen incessantly for all eternity to the clamor and cries of the companies of their torments. You have no choice. You won't be able to, sh you know, you're not going to be able to shut your hearing off. You know what it's like to hear most people, thank God, we haven't experienced listening to someone being tortured. But you ever talk to someone that has? It's horrible, they say. They have some, you listen to someone being tortured, screaming, begging for help. Hell is going to be loaded with millions of people. And they're all going to be crying out. They're all going to be tortured. And the sounds are going to be horrible. You would wish that you could not ever hear again. But your hearing will be a billion times better than it is now. A billion times. You'll be able to hear every ounce of torture that's going on in hell. The sense of taste for all those that give in to gluttony, drunkenness, and so on. The dam will be tormented by ravenous hunger, but they will never receive even the slightest morsel of bread. Their thirst will be so great that not all the water of the ocean will be able to quench it, but they will never be allowed a single drop. Never. The sense of touch, the big one, and this is the reason why most souls go to hell for sins of the flesh. The pain which most severely torments the senses of the dam arises from the fire of hell, which tortures the same sense of touch. Even in this life, the pain of fire is the greatest pain one can know. And you don't believe that, go to 
burn center. Go to a hospital where firemen are and people that got burnt. It's horrible. And they got to peel the skin off and the new skin comes. The skin is stretching. They are in agonizing pain. And it feels like it's never going to end. But in earth, you know, it will go away eventually. But not in hell. St. Vincent Ferreira says that in comparison with the fire of hell, all fire is ice cold. The reason is that the fire on this earth has been created for our use. But God has made the fire of hell purposely to torment the damned. They will have an abyss of fire below, an abyss of fire above them, an abyss of fire on every side. If they touch or see or breathe, they touch and see and breathe nothing but fire. The dam in hell will live in fire like fish in a water bowl. But this fire will not only surround the dam, but it will also enter into their very bowels to torment them. Their bodies will become as fire. Thus this fire will burn the bowels, the heart, the brain, the blood within the veins and even the marrow within their bones. Each of the damned will be in himself a furnace of fire. Psalm 20, verse 10 says, They shall make them as a furnace of fire. We come now to the powers of the soul, because the soul will suffer. The soul has three faculties, you say. So the first is that the damned will be tormented in their memory. By the remembrance of the time which was given to them in this life. That they might have saved their soul. In which they spent in procuring their own damnation. By the remembrance of the graces which they have received from God. And of which they have not profited. So in hell, our memory is bad. I don't know about you. The older I get, <laughs> my memory gets bad. But in hell, guess what? Your memory will be perfect. Not only you remember, you will remember and know every grace that God gave you in this world and how you didn't cooperate with it. It's going to torture you because you say, you remember that night when that priest preached on hell and he told you to get in a confessional? You laughed. He said, he don't know what he's talking about. You'll remember that night and every grace that he gave you. You remember all the people that he put in your life, how people come into our lives. There's no such thing as coincidences. God's always manifesting his love to us. He's always putting, he's the hound of heaven. He's coming after us because he doesn't want to lose any of us. You'll remember all of those things. You don't even know them now. But in hell, they will torture you because you'll realize all I have to do is say yes. All I do is say yes. You remember all the times your wife was telling you to straighten your act out and you were like, get out of here, shut up! I don't have to listen to you. Who are you? And you're going to realize she did that out of love for you. And I, we could go on and on. But you'll remember everything. Everything. And how you turned your back on God. In, in hell, they will be tormented in their understanding. By thinking about the great good which they have lost in losing heaven and God. And that this loss is forever and irreparable. That is torture. Because in here, on, on life, we're dealing with mysteries, even with the faith. And a mystery, we don't understand everything. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a mystery. But in hell, or in heaven, the mystery is going to be revealed. You'll understand it totally. So you'll understand who God is. If you die right now and you're sentenced to hell, you're going to know instantly He's real. Everything the Catholic Church said is true about God. It's too late, though. You're going to hell. And hell will torture you because you're going to see that you lost the greatest, good, beautiful God. You'll realize that you could have such a beautiful uh, eternity in heaven. You're going to know all these things and you're going to understand it. And you're going to understand that you can never fix it. Never. The soul in hell will be tortured in the will. The will will be tortured by seeing that they will be refused whatsoever they desire. The miserable beings will never have anything they desire. 
and will forever be afflicted with the eternal torments which they hate. They would wish to be rid of these torments and to enjoy peace, but in these torments they will remain forever and peace they will never find. So in hell, you know that. Everything that you desire, you're going to desire so many things. You're going to desire that the fire stops, that the smoke stops, that the screeching stops. You're going to desire to eat. If you ever go without food for a long time, the pain, most painful way to die, starvation, because then comes dehydration. You're not going to have water, nothing. Can you, should, you beg God just for the pain to stop for one second. It will never stop. You'll be denied everything because you deny God. The greatest pain, my friends, will be the pain of loss. The pain of loss increases in proportion to the value of one has lost. When you're in hell, you have lost God. And therefore, the pain is infinite because He's the infinite good. In this world, reprobates, these souls that are on their way to hell, they live in blindness. But at death, they will know what they have lost. Conviction that God is infinitely good and that He is compelled to hate Him while He sees that He is worthy of infinite love. They will hate and curse God, His benefits of creation. They'll curse the day they were born. They'll curse their mother and father for cooperating with God, brought him into life. They wish they didn't exist. They will curse redemption. That God died on the cross and made it possible for them to get to heaven and it would have been easy if they cooperated. They will curse Him for doing that. The sacraments, they will curse with a fury. Baptism, holy confirmation, the Eucharist, confession, matrimony, holy orders, all the great sacraments. Because God gave us those sacraments and you'll realize in hell the power of those sacraments. And that if you would have just cooperated and took advantage of them, you would have a great place in heaven. It will torture you. That confession, the sacrament, you'll hate it. Because all you had to do was humble yourself and tell the priest, your sins and change your life and you be in heaven instead of burning hell. You'll curse all the saints, especially your patron saint. That's why God loves you so much. And the church, church tells you when you're baptized, you have to have a saint's name. Why? Because that saint's a protector. How many people don't, uh, you know, these priests, they shouldn't baptize babies without saint's name. You're depriving your child of a patron, a protector. And you'll curse that saint because God's going to reveal to you throughout your whole life how that saint was trying to help you, praying for you, interceding in heaven, trying to, and you just blew it off. You'll curse your guardian angel more than anything. God loves us so much that the moment you're conceived in your mother's womb, an angel is assigned to protect you, guide you, and get you to heaven. When you die in the particular judgment, it will be very clear God's going to manifest to you all the times your angel helped you. All the time your angel saved you from dying earlier than you did. All the time the angel whispered in your ear, don't do that. Don't do it. Go to confession. Listen to that priest. You'll hate your angel because you'll see all he did for you. That angel, God loves, never leaves our side. They say when we commit, if you commit wicked sins, the angel weeps, but he never leaves your side. Never. You'll curse your angel. Man, you want to read about the guardian angels. They're awesome. There's a book about Padre Pio and the angels. I can't recommend it enough. You see the power of the angels. How many people were saved car crashes? How many people, you know, so many miraculous things with angels. You can read about this, it will inspire you. But in hell, they'll curse them. In hell, you will curse the Blessed Virgin for all eternity. You will despise her with your whole heart. And that's torture because she's the most beautiful creature God created. And you'll know that. And you'll have to curse her. You'll hate her. 
Because she's the mediatrix of all graces. There's no salvation without the Blessed Mother. Every grace that we received in this life was given to us through the Mother of God. Why? Because God chose it that way. And the demons hate her. Hate her. And you'll realize in heaven, if I would have just called on her, she's the terror of demons. They hate her. Her and her seed crushes the demon's head. Well, all I had to do was beg her to help me. You don't even have to beg her. She's a mother. And you'll hate her. And they curse her. Hell, my friends. One of the scariest meditations for myself is when I meditate on that hell is for eternity. Hell is forever. He who enters will not be part for all eternity. There is one gate for admission. There is no exit. You cross that gate, it's sealed. You'll never cross it again. Never. Never. In hell, there is no hope. No hope. Why? Because the damned know they're done. They're fried forever. In this world, we have hope. Hope is that we believe in the promises that Christ has revealed. And we know if we suffer, if we're faithful, we're going to possess heaven. And that helps push us on. But in the hell, in, in hell, there's no hope. They say, I'm never getting out of here. I'm done. I gotta suffer this forever and ever and ever. The damned not only suffer these torments of each moment, but in each moment they endure the pain of eternity. Saying what I now suffer, I must suffer forever. I'm gonna repeat that. It's mind boggling. The damned not only suffer the torments of each moment, but in each moment they endure the pain of eternity. Saying what I now suffer, I must suffer forever. That's scary. All of us have suffered some kind of pain in this world. Maybe you broke a leg. Maybe you had an appendix that was ready to burst. Whatever pain you had, one of the things that helps is you know, you take your medication, the pain's going to go away. But you imagine when you have something and you say, that ain't never going to leave. Who taught you? Bad toothache. I had a toothache once so bad, I had a wisdom tooth, I had to get pulled. I, I couldn't believe it. I'm not a man that cried. I had tears coming down my eyes. The pain was excruciating. I said, is this going to stop? I thought I was going to die. In hell, what they suffer, they suffer every moment is an eternity. And the bottom line is this. Judas has been in hell for 2,000 years. Guess what? It's like his first moment. 2,000 years, nothing. One of the fathers of the church said this, said, to give you an example of what hell is, he says, picture most of the, the earth is made up of what? Water, right? Three quarters of the earth is water. We have oceans that are over 5,000 feet deep. He goes, picture this. Imagine you empty all the oceans. And picture this. At the rate it would take to fill up that ocean with one drop of water a year. Make believe the water drop wouldn't evaporate. Is how long would it take to fill up those oceans? He says eventually trillions, whatever it is, who knows the number it would take. It would, it would happen as time keeps going on. And you know what eternity is when that finally reaches that point? Empty all the oceans and start again. Those in hell right now wish that it could be, say, like that. They would suffer the pains in hell even happily, gladly, if they knew in 50 billion, trillion years, they would get out. They're never getting out. And they know it. Hell is irrevocable. You don't get an appeal. You can't appeal to a higher court. You can't appeal to a higher judge. My friends, don't play fast and loose with your soul. Don't play fast and loose with your children's soul. This is serious stuff. All the great saints meditated on this all the time. My Holy Father, St. Francis, most of the time when you see him, he has a skull by his feet. Why? Because he always meditated upon death, hell. St. Teresa of Avila had a skull in the refectory. That's where you eat. And they said she used to drink out of that skull too. Always reflecting on death. 
always reflecting on what hell is one of the greatest remedies to fight sin. St. Teresa of Avila, the great mystic once, she said the greatest gift she ever received from God, the greatest grace, he showed her her place in hell if she wouldn't walk straight. Matt, you know what kind of graces that woman received? She was a great mystic. She had full union with God on earth. And she said that was the greatest grace she received. So I want to go through right now real quick. I want to read from some of the mystics that have, that have the approval of the church and that have seen hell. And, you know, give you their description of hell. It's real, man. Remember that young man came to the mission. He was there himself. He admitted, he says, everything he said is true. The first one is one of my favorites. She's not a blessed. She should be a saint. Her name is Sister Yosefa Mendez. And you can get the book called The Way of Divine Love from Tan. Sister Yosefa Mendez, when she entered, she was in, from Spain. When she entered religious life, God decided to do something extraordinary with her. She, he would send her physically to hell to suffer, especially for priests, that they wouldn't go there. And she describes hell. She would physically be taken into hell. And so she had to tell her superiors this. So one day her superiors are in her cell. That's your room in religious life. And two of the superiors, one sitting on each side. And she's telling them that she's, they thought she was nuts. Say, so she's crazy. And right in front of them, she disappeared. Totally disappeared. They were panicking. They started praying the rosary. And I forgot how much time went back. But after a while, Sister Josefa Mendes popped back up in between them in the room. And her habit was on fire. And smoke was coming up from her habit. Her whole back was burnt. And there was such a stench of sofa that Sister, the nuns had to run out of the room. And they believed her. So Sister Yosefa, this she gives a description of hell. She says, one day she was in hell and physically there. She says, one of the damned souls cried out, this is my torture that I want to love and cannot. There is nothing left me but hatred and despair. If one of us could so much as make a single act of love, this would no longer be hell. We cannot. We live on hatred and hatred alone. Some yell out because of the martyrdom of their hands. Perhaps they were thieves, for they say, Where is our loot now, cursed hands? Why did I want to possess what did not belong to me? And what in any case I could only keep for a few days? Others cursed their tongues, their eyes, whatever was the occasion of their sins. Now, O oh body, you are paying the price of the delights you granted yourself, and you did it of your own free will. Why? I saw many worldly people falling into hell, and no words can render their horrible and terrifying cries. They cried out, Damn, forever! I deceive myself! I am lost! I am here forever! There is no remedy possible! A curse on me. Some curse people, other circumstances, and all curse the occasion of their damnation. Another day, she says, Today I saw a vast number of people falling into the fiery pit of hell. They seemed to be worldlings, and a demon cried out loudly, The world is ripe for me. I know that the best way to get hold of souls is to rouse their desire. For enjoyment. Put me first. Me before the rest. No humility for me. But let me enjoy myself. This is what the holy woman witnessed all the time in hell. Great saint. Another mystic. You see, remember share how many souls have fallen by hundreds? Sister Lucia and Fatima. She said they were falling into hell like snowflakes in the winter. Falling into hell like leaves falling off the tree in the fall. Our Lord says that many, many, many go to hell. He says the road to perdition is wide, easy. Many, many, many. St. Thomas Aquinas, the great doctor of the church, 
said to the majority of adult baptized Catholics, we'll go to hell. Scary. You want to read a sermon that will really shake you up? St. Leonard of Port Maurice read on the number of those saved. I don't do it on the mission. You know why? I don't want people to despair. That's why I don't preach on it. I'm not joking. Another great mystic. She's one of my favorite saints. Her name is St. Veronica Giuliani. St. Veronica Giuliani lived in the 17th century, and she was a poor clad nun, cloistered, and she had the wounds of Christ. She had all the wounds, the stigmata. She is a great saint. I get the dates here and all. February 14, 1694, she said she saw hell open. Many souls were falling into it, hideous and black and terrifying to behold. They disappeared into the middle of the flames. She could hear the howls and the blasphemy of the dam, and with it all there was a stench and horrible darkness. Another day, she said the Blessed Virgin appeared to her, summoned two angels to be her guardian, and led her in spirit to the gates of hell. She found herself facing a darksome place, deep and stinking, out of which came noises of animals, the hissing of snakes, dreadful voices, and the clap of thunder. She perceived the tall mountain all covered with serpents and vipers. Curses were issuing forth from beneath them. Then the mountain opened and seemed to be filled of damned souls, and the demons holding them bound with chains of fire. She saw other mountains, the scenes of torments even more cruel. In the center of this infernal abode was raised up a throne. There sat Lucifer, a frightful sight to see. He seemed to have a headpiece composed of a hundred heads, all stuffed with spears, and on the butt of each there was a sort of eye amid in spurts of fire, which set all hell ablaze. The number of demons and damned were incalculable, incalculable. Yet each of these beheld this horror, horrible head, and received from Lucifer torment upon torment. He saw them all, and they all saw him. Exact opposite, my friends, of the beatific vision. She goes on. Here, she said, my angel gave me to understand that just as in heaven, the sight of God brings happiness to all the saints. So here in hell, that dreadful form of Lucifer, that hellish monster, brings torments to the damned. Their greatest punishment is loss of soul. This is the pain that Lucifer endures, first of all. And then the rest of them participate in it. He blasphemes, and they all blaspheme. He curses, and so do they. He suffers and is tortured, and all suffered and are tortured too. I believe, she said finally, that if I had not had my angel with me and had not been fortified by my dear Blessed Virgin Mother, I would have died of horror. All I have told of it is a mere nothing, and all that I have heard of it from preachers is nothing at all when compared to what I saw. And I'm going to give you one more. His name is Venerable Bernard Francis de Hoyos. In the 17th century, he said, one day he was doing the spiritual exercises. He had a terrible vision. At God's command, his angel guardian conducted him to the edge of the abyss of hell. He said, I saw, he said, an immense sea of fire, some of the damned driven by fury, came back from it, but fell back at once, drawn in by the devils and dragged towards the abyss. Then I beheld the particular forms of punishment which are dealt to the unchaste, the covetous, the malicious, and others, overcome at the sight of these monstrosities and deafened by their blasphemies, I averted my eyes. After we had gone a long way, Father, my angel said to me, Come and look and write down what you see. Then the path I was following gapped before me, and I saw a hollow cave even more horrible than the first. Here were imprisoned unworthy priests, guilty of sacrilege. These wretches suffered more than the rest of the damned. They were tormented especially in those parts of the body which had touched the sacred host. Their hands were like burning coals. Their tongues were torn and hanging out of their mouths. Their hearts were consumed with intense fire. 
a prey too frightful to behold. Scary stuff, my friends, and it's all true. Look at the punishments God has for those. Imagine those priests, he's saying, that touch the sacred host and they desecrate Jesus. Priests have so much to answer for. Pray for them. Nobody, but nobody commands God. Only the priest. The priest, yes, commands God. Only a priest commands God. The Blessed Virgin never commanded God. She requested And she's always granted her request. But the priest, every day when he goes up to that altar, and he demands God because he says the words that God instituted himself. This is my body. This is my blood. God must come down from heaven. If he uses proper form, matter, proper intention, he commands God. And why? Because God wants to feed his flock. And the punishment for those priests that desecrate the Eucharist, that confect the sacrament of mortal sin, is horrible. Look at the horror in our church, communion in the hand. All those people, you go to hell, you're going to pay if you abuse our Lord. Our Lord is embedded in the rugs and in the floors throughout our whole country and the world because the communion on the hand is an abomination. How can you receive God in your hand when you know He's going to end up on the floor? Because there's always particles left. Let us pray, my friends, that we have an understanding of hell, that we don't want to go there, and that we don't want our children, our loved ones, to go there. And so this, help, this talk is to help you to keep yourself out of there, but others. No one goes to hell alone. No one goes to heaven alone. You go to hell, you're going to bring many with you. You go to heaven, you're going to bring many with you. St. Alphonse Ligari says, One good priest brings thousands and thousands of souls to heaven. But one bad one brings thousands to hell. And that's why the devil attacks the priest more than anything. Because he says, if I get that guy, he's going to bring the whole troop with me. He's going to bring his whole parish with him got to pray. you got to pray. And so one of the things I want to talk about right now is the importance of being getting into intercessory prayer. The importance of knowing how to do combat against the devil. The importance that you got to know that you can prevent souls from going to hell. Not only your own soul. But God wants to raise up a mighty army. He wants to raise people up like you that know who they are. And know the faith that we can participate in redemption of others, not just the priest, but you. But you. So we need to have the spirit of martyrs. So what if they cut your head off? God promises to put it back on. And you'll have a great glory. But we need souls now to reach out. How you win someone over who's away from God. Away from the faith. How? You gotta pray. You gotta get on your knees. You gotta wear your knees out. You gotta fast. You gotta go to sacraments. You have to have mass. So you gotta be willing to fight for your loved ones. I want to tell you a story. It's a powerful story. I don't know, five, six years ago I was driving in Rhode Island. I stopped to see this old Italian guy, you know. And he had his friend came over. Her name was Virginia, and I knew her. And she says, "Father, my my husband Joe died." I said, "Oh, I'm very sorry." And I knew Joe. She said to me, "I want to tell you something about Joe that you didn't know." I said, "Sure." She says, "Father, he didn't go to church for 45 years. He didn't practice faith." Joe had another problem. He was prejudiced. He hated black people. He hated blacks. And she said whenever a black person would walk by, he would curse that black person like he'd come like an animal. And she said he, she never even knew why he hated black people. She said, why do you hate them? They're God's children. He just hated them. And so, what happens to Joe? He's in his 80s. He's, he has a problem. He goes to the hospital. I said, you're dying. Go home. So they send him home. So she needed help with Joe. And so they send an aide to help Joe. 
And so the first week, whatever, the aide had to quit. I don't know why. And so you call the agency up, and they said, we'll send a new one tomorrow. So early in the morning, doorbell rings, ding dong, and a little old nice Italian lady, Virginia, walks through the door, opens the door, and she is like this. <laughs> she almost fell over. Guess who's at the door? He goes, hello. He goes, you all right? Went to grab her. She looked like she was going to fall. He goes, my name is Steve. I'm here. I'm the new aide. He was like a six foot two black man. <laughs> and Virginia's like, uh, she's like, oh man, my husband's gonna, he hates black people. He's gonna curse this man. How can I let this man even go in there? Why should I subject him to this? And she don't know. She's just so stunned. She said, the man walked in. And Joe didn't curse him. So he said, it's out of work. He said, Joe, let me clean you up. He goes, no, no, you know. So, but two weeks go by. Joe talks to him every day. Steve's talking to him. He's a really happy guy, this guy. She didn't tell me, but I bet you this man knew God. And so they would play chess every day. And in like two weeks, Steve is there. And Steve went to move one of his pieces. And all of a sudden, Joe grabbed his arm. Imagine he touched the black man. And he lived. <laughs> touched the black man. He hated black people. Grabbed Steve's arm. And he looked at him in his eyes. He said, Steve, I love you. That makes me almost cry. How did a man like that get the grace to embrace a black man that he hated his whole life, cursed him? How did that happen? After that, he called for the priest. The priest came, confessed him, anointed him, holy viaticum. Joe died. But he saved. He made it. How? Because Virginia tells the rest of the story. She said, Father, I never gave up on my husband. I prayed at least three rosaries a day for his conversion. I begged the Blessed Virgin to have mercy on my husband. She did. Are you willing to be like Virginia? Are you willing to wear out your knees? Pray the rosary. Beg Our Lady to convert your husband, your wife, your children, to convert our wicked president and the rest of them, to convert our enemies that want to kill us. This is what's needed in the church today. And this is what's missing. We're too caught up in ourselves, selfish. So how do we get these grace? Once again, every grace we receive comes through the Blessed Virgin. Our lady came to us many times at Fatima. She gave us the plan. She said, pray the rosary. She said, the rosary will stop wars, will stop famines. Pray the rosary. Do we listen to her? you got to pray the rosary as a family. I counsel a lot of people. And believe me, I don't waste time. You don't want to cooperate, get lost. There's many souls out there that want help I can't get to. So if you're not going to work, get lost. Take a hike. I'll work with someone who wants to work. Everyone that listens to me, and they come and they think, Father's so smart and he's going to have these big answers. No, I'm a dummy. Pray the rosary. Is that all, Father? What advice should I have? Pray the rosary. It works. It works. Recently, I had a man hate his wife, want to kill her, hated her. She was a good woman. And he said, I hate her. And he told, I counseled him right in front of me, and he said, I hate you. I hate you. I despise you. I resent you. And I'm looking at him. I said, this guy got a demon on him. I said, man, i got to do some work with you. I said, you're going to start praying the rosary, my friend, with the family. And I worked with him. And I said, but when you pray the rosary, you have to pray, you have to petition our Lord. St. Louis the Moffat said, if you pray the rosary, you become a saint. So why don't we have saints? He said, there's three main reasons. We pray the rosary too fast. Number two, we don't meditate on the mysteries, and you have to. Number three, you have to pray for the virtue that you need. So I told this man, I said, listen to me. Both of you, I want you to pray the rosary every night. Because he still had a fear of God in him, thank God. I told him he's going to go to hell if he don't knock it off. So 
I said, when you pray to Rosie, you pray to Blessed Virgin that you two fall madly in love with each other. And they both like laughed. And I said, you for real? I said, I'm for real. You pray that you fall madly in love with each other. And the man was almost like, like laughing. I said, you do it. So he promised me he would do it. I don't know. It wasn't too long. A couple of months after, I get a call from Dave from him. He goes, listen, I'm going to put my wife on. I want her to tell you something. I said, sure. I didn't know what I was going to hear. I thought maybe she can tell me, you know, he tried to kill her. <laughs> so she gets on the phone. He said, tell father what I just told you. So he said, they came, he came home in the house, she said. It was late, so she wasn't dressed up any fancy thing, you know, getting ready for bed. She said, he looked at me. He said, you know, that priest, <laughs> that priest, he goes, and he looked at it, he goes, man, I am falling in love with you. I can't believe how much I love you. Can you imagine that? He said, I can't believe. And he, he still calls me, tells me, thanks me. He goes, I'm crazy about my wife. I can't believe it. I think about her all the time. It's consuming me. I said, good. Good. The rosary, the Blessed Mother can do these miracles in your life too. She can. He, he can. And he will. And so Our Lady of Fatima has the peace plan. She told us what it's all about. She told us most souls go to hell because no one will pray for them or do penance for them. Why should the devil get your children? Why should the devil get your wife, your husband, your mother, your father? Why should he get the lowest person on the face of the earth? Murderers, rapists. Christ died for those souls. He owns them. So we have to enter spiritual combat. We've got to pray. Consecrate yourself to the mother of God. Which means you give yourself totally to her. You become our possession, property. You give all your merits to her. St. Louis de Moffat talks about this. St. Maximilian Colby, the great saints. There's not one saint that didn't love Our Lady. St. Joseph of Faso, great saint, says, Show me a priest that does not love Our Lady. He says, he goes, expect no good from him. He'll do no good. Show me a priest that loves Our Lady. He goes, he will do great things and great miracles. We have to love Our Lady. And so the great saints, St. Maximilian, say, we consecrate, we give our ourselves as a possession property. Say, Blessed Mother, I give myself to you totally as your possession property. Do with me what you will in this world and the next. All your actions, all the merits you accumulate, you give to the Blessed Mother. Every time you go to communion, you say, I give this communion to you. Do what you want with it, Blessed Mother. And she will. And then you say, every time you do something, you do it for the love of her. Say, Blessed Mother, I do this for love of you. Save souls. It's not what you do, my friends, but it's the love that you do it with. And so you don't have to do big things. Everybody thinks you have to do these big things. No. Like I said yesterday, what did, according to the world, what did the Blessed Virgin do? According to the world, she did nothing. Ah, she was a housewife. She cooked, she cleaned, and she prayed. What's that big deal? What's that? But she did it with a love that's mind-boggling. And that's why she's the greatest saint. And so we want to imitate Christ, who was totally dependent on his mother. And that's what consecration is. We become totally dependent on her. And we give her everything. St. Louis de Montfort used a beautiful analogy. He says, picture the king sitting on his throne and the queen is on his right. And there's a line of people coming up to, to the king and bringing him gifts. And the queen's sitting and she sees on the back of the line there's this pauper, a peasant. And she looks at him and the peasant has bad clothes, dirty clothes, holes in it. The peasant probably smells. The peasant had a little apple. And so the queen says, no way, the king will not accept that. So she says to the king, can I ex excuse me, please? And she said, yes, I'll be right back. And she goes, she takes the peasant and says, come with me. My king won't accept you like that. So she takes the apple. She shines it up bright red, rosy red. She puts it on a silver platter or gold platter. Puts flour around. She goes, I'm going to take you to the king. And he will he won't reject you. So when took the peasant to the king, the king was happy. That peasant is us. The king is Christ. And the queen is the virgin mother. The son never says no to her. So when you give her your merits... 
she takes them and she purifies. It becomes her merits now. And because it's her, any impurity in that is gone. And it magnifies in value. And so there could be a soul right now, I tell people all the time, dying in China, that God wants in heaven. And you pick up a piece of paper, I always use this simple example, in the floor and say, Mary, I do this for love of you. You could save maybe a thousand souls with that. Because the Blessed Virgin will take it. So consecrate yourself. And those of you that um, have children, you have maternal rights over your children, paternal rights. Consecrate your children, even when they're in your womb. And when you do that, that child becomes a possession of the Blessed Virgin and she never loses any property of her. Never. My mother did that to me. My mother didn't tell me this too till she brought me to the seminary one day. But once she did, she said, Son, I want to tell you something. I consecrated you in my womb to be a priest. And I renewed that consecration and you was born. And she goes, and she wrote to Padre Pio and said, request to be a spiritual child and requested that he pray for me to be a priest. My name was James. And Padre Pio wrote back and accepted her and said that I would be a priest one day. My mother never told me that. And I lived a wicked life away from God for 17 years. My mother was like that old lady, Virginia. She wore her knees out with the rosary. I never saw my mother without a rosary. My mother ended up telling me in the end that she offered herself to God as a sacrifice. Whatever it would take to save her husband and her children. Even if she didn't see it, she said. And God took her up on it. God took her up. My mother was sick when I entered the seminary. They didn't know what was wrong with her. It took two years to find out what was wrong with her. She had a rare blood disease, amyloidosis. It's like oh, the closest you could compare it to is like leukemia. It's in the blood and it destroys your organ one at a time. First thing that went was her kidneys. And my mother literally lived on the cross for six years. She spent more time in the hospital than anything. God stripped her of everything. She didn't complain. She always had the rosary. Always prayed. And she, I said to her, you know, my I pray for her. She goes, I offered myself. I'm not going to take it back. God can do with me what he wills. The only thing that matters is that my children are saved in the end. My father died many years ago, and he never practiced his faith. He converted, but he didn't practice. A year and a half before he died, he had a conversion, went to Mass every day for a year and a half. That's because of my mother. It's prayers. And then my mother, she suffered tremendously. And I never forget, I used to go sometimes when I could. They let me go see her. She was uh, in the hospital, dialysis. And she always had, I, I used to wonder, I said, you know, the more she prays, the worse the pain gets. I wonder what these people that don't know God think about her, what's going on. If they're confused, they, they, or if they're mocking, saying, look, the more she prays, the worse it gets. Well, I found out at the funeral, because people came from all over to my mother's funeral, and it was amazing. Doctors, rich doctors, many of them came. Nurses, fellow patients came. And it was that guy, they were all at a fight. They said, never had a patient like your mother. She never complained. She always prayed to her rosaries, those beads. People came, patients, they would say they couldn't believe. But she had Our Lady. And they, the day they called me, I, I should have known that she was dying. Because it was the first time the whole family was there together in the hospital in all those years, six years. And I didn't want to take all the time up, but I thought she was going to pull through that day. I was hoping she would. And so I let my nieces and nephews go in. So the last thing I said to her, I hold her, she could talk. I said, Ma, you know, the only thing that matters is God's holy will. If you accept your death, St. Alphonse teaches you go straight to heaven, Ma. Because that's the greatest thing you could give God back is what he's given you. You will. And she said to me the last words my mother said, Son, my whole life, all I tried to do was God's will. That was the last word my mother said to me. And then went out, they took her up, and she died. And I say that, but I wouldn't be standing here, and I still wouldn't make heaven yet. So I tell her, you know, you still got a lot of work to do. But I'm telling you that because you have the same. 
power in the sense, if you tap into the sacrament, if you have a deep love for the Blessed Mother, you too will convert your children through the prayers. God converts them, but He needs, He wants your prayers. He doesn't need them. He wants them. And believe me, the rosary is the way. Do the rosary. You'll have miracles in your house. I want to end with a quote by St. Anthony Mary Claret. And he used to pray this. He says how often he would pray this with St. Catherine of Siena. So I guess it was a prayer of St. Catherine. And he says, Oh my God, grant me a place by the gates of hell that I may stop those who enter there saying, Where are you going, unhappy one? Back! Go back! Make a good confession. Save your soul. Don't come here to be lost for eternity. Let us pray today for all the souls that God's going to take home. Let us pray that they all repent, that they all save their souls and are with God for eternity. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's going to be a collection now. And once again, I live off of divine providence. So whatever God puts on your heart, I thank you for it. And it helps me to continue my ministry. Also, after the collection, I'm going to hear confessions. And Father Michael Rodriguez is going to expose the Blessed Sacrament. So we're going to have our Lord here, present. And Father is going to lead some prayers. So I hope you stay and worship God and beg Him. Beg Him for the graces you need for yourself and for your family.